Uh, welcome everyone to the October 13th Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, a couple of things that we must abide by. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, um, which is linked specifically in the agenda. So as far as announcements go today, uh, we have the standard announcement, the Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. If you have anything that you'd like to be included in that, please leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Uh, the second announcement, and you may, may have already noticed some changes happening, but uh, the charter changes have been approved uh, and we are now the technical oversight committee, not the technical steering committee. So uh, I have the charter linked here in the agenda. If you wanna see the specific changes uh, that were included, there were a few other changes besides that, um, besides that reading that happened. Any other announcements that anybody has? Okay. Uh, so if there's no other announcements, uh, we do have uh, the outstanding URSA report. I did send a reminder on the Discord channel um, about a week ago, and uh, we're still waiting on that. I also included links to the uh, reports that had basically hadn't had uh, a whole lot of reviews that had happened. I did notice that but most of these have been almost completely reviewed by everybody. But if you still are outstanding, please do have a look at those particular reports. Um, the only one that I saw that had any sort of question was a question that I had on the Firefly one related to the organizational diversity of the maintainers. Um, I have not yet seen an answer to that. So I don't know that we have anybody here from Firefly today. No, I don't see anybody on the participant list from Firefly. So we'll we'll wait to get, a, get that answered on the report. We but Tracy, have... I thought yeah, the report ahead. actually says that it's uh, all the maintainers are from Kaleido. Did it say that? Uh, I wonder if it got changed after the fact. Um, yeah, so maybe the question has been sure. answered. Uh, no one is here. Ten out of ten. Okay, yes, it does say that. Uh, so I guess the question is answered. Um, we will uh, assume that I didn't miss it, or maybe I did miss it. And uh, either way, it's there now. So thanks for that, Arna. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, but um, I saw your question, and then. I thought, oh, but I think it's answered. And I had the same thought. Maybe they changed it, didn't say in response to your comment, but so it's there anyway. I call it done. Any other questions uh, that anybody has on the reports? And Dana, I saw you come off mute, but I, we couldn't hear you if you were speaking. Um, can you hear me now? No, you're very faint. Barely, okay. I'm in a talking city. I saw Jim Zane here at DevCon, and I think he said he had a flight today. So I think that's why Firefly's not on the call. Okay, yeah. I did see Jim's uh, regrets since uh, somewhere. I think it may have been Discord. So thanks for that, Dana. Okay, any other questions on the, the reports? Okay, uh, so if there's no other questions on the report, we do have the fabric in the cactus reports that are due today. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing those show up and uh, we'll be including those on the, uh, on the agenda for next week. So the only thing that I have for topics today is the TOC election for that is upcoming. Um, before we before we get there, are there any other topics that anybody would like to add to the agenda? Okay, so let's take a look at the the TOC election for 2022. Uh, I did copy in the the charter here. 
uh, into this document, uh, the composition. Uh, as we probably recall, there'll, there'll be six uh, individuals that will be elected by the maintainers of the projects, and then five appointees that will be appointed by the governing board uh, to make up the 11 TOC members for next uh, for the next term. Uh, so that's uh, directly from the charter as it stands today. Um, so I have put together this document along with the help of Rai and Min on uh, just exactly what this process and timeline is going to look like. Uh, so if we look at the nomination process and timeline, uh, I'm hoping that we can start this process next week uh, and have people nominate themselves uh, through the end of October uh, to run for the, the TOC. I'm hoping this timeline works. It's kind of quick turnaround, but I, I'm hoping we can manage that. Um, as far as what it what is required, we need to gather the GitHub IDs for the active maintainers and the active contributors. I have done some changes to our, what was once called our voters uh, check site. It's now an eligibility check site that will allow you to see if you're eligible to run or, or, and or eligible to vote uh, in the upcoming TOC election. Uh, we have some standard templates that are um, that need to be updated to reflect the 2022 dates. And uh, we need to send out communication to people to let them know that the TOC nomination is happening. Um, and then uh, reminder sort of communication to ensure that people are um, aware that <laughs> the timeline is ending. Uh, and then the nominations would close end of day Pacific um, to get the list of nominees. So any questions on kind of this nomination process uh, or any concerns with what you see kind of written here? So I have a question. The second thing there, mm -hmm. I thought I thought part of the plan was to avoid having to do this. So I'm a bit surprised that it's there. Building this list of active contributors. Yeah. So if we go back up to the charter, um, we'll see that the uh, I think it's four a i. It says that individuals who are active within the, within the scope of the Hyperledger Foundation and who have nominated themselves for the TSP. Um, so I guess the the challenge was how do we determine who's active? And uh, the, the thought was that the active people are the people who have contributed. But I agree, Arno, I think that's always been a, a concern. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we do still need to figure out if people who nominate themselves should be uh, nominating themselves. So wait, let me make sure I understand. This article mm -hmm. four, the active contributor is to do what? It's those who are eligible to run for the talk, right? Yeah, so 4.a.i uh, says that individuals who are active within the scope of the Hyperledger Foundation and who have nominated themselves yeah. for the TSC, right? So I think that's uh, the, what we need to be clear. It's like active contributors can run and maintainers can vote. That's correct. But so I, yeah, I, I was wondering, I mean, if, you know, the staff should really go through the process of building this list of active contributor, which may be very time consuming as opposed to just check that the people who get nominated are qualified. And it may sound like it's the same, but I don't think it is the same because you don't need to you know, go out of your way to figure out the whole list of possible active contributors rather than just checking specific individuals whether they are they qualify or not. But it's a detail in implementation, but you know, again, I, I thought one of the motivations of the change was to try to simplify the process. And I'm afraid that this is the worst part that was from the previous uh, process. If we carry it over, we have kind of missed the boat somewhere there. 
but I see Dano as his hand up, so I'll shut up. <laughs> so I kind of agree that um, we shouldn't gather the contributors. We should only gather the maintainers, which should be a fairly easy thing for the maintainers list in each project. But I think we could flip it, kind of Arnold seeing If you nominate yourself to serve on the TLC, um, one of your duties is to provide proof that you've been an active contributor. Maybe we have a, a question in there. Please describe your contributions to Hyperledger or provide the proof as part of their self-nomination. All right. So thought, good thought. Um, I think that's right, yes? Yep, sorry, I'm Hyperledger community. Um, no can I share my screen? Sure. So I have this uh, daisy row where I've been running scripts that uh, download the GitHub uh, event logs every day back to 2016. And then I have scripts in here that are running to uh, extract uh, the people that have done anything. Um, so that's fairly already automated. I agree with the rewording that was proposed. You know, uh, I also have this uh, maintainer list uh, that gathers all of the maintainer files once a day. And then I have a list of the maintainers from those. Um, so those lists already exist. The list of maintainers already exist. Um, and I, I also have a, uh, I have 60 something open bugs against repos that don't have a maintainers file. So it's, uh, you know, the, it, for the most part, it's completely automated, um, but I would like that wording change to, to uh, make that happen. Okay, so uh, the recommendation is that in the nominee email, we change it to say, um please include your contributions to the hyperledger foundation in the past year that works for me any any comments or concerns on that yeah i mean we probably can hint that maybe it's simply providing your github uh you know id with the activity is good enough for most people, I think that will do it. And then the edge cases, it may, re it may require a bit more, but. So David and I uh, discussed this earlier. Um, for the previous election, we had, I think, uh, 22 nominations. We had maybe another half dozen people that requested uh, to run that had no activity. Um, so it's fairly easy to to gate that what i don't want to do is uh, because a contributor is defined as people who do stuff in the wiki and and stuff like that um it isn't like it was before where we had to check a million emails um so yeah let's change that toc nominee wording and uh i, I think that's going to be much much easier Okay, I just uh, updated uh, this page. Uh, eventually it'll come through to you, but if you wouldn't mind refreshing. Um, uh, yeah, scroll down. Uh, so I added the contributions that I have had to the Hyperledger Foundation. It kind of goes off the page here on the email itself. Um, but it basically says, uh, the yeah, the contribution. I don't know why it's not um, showing quite right, but anyway. Uh, contributions that I've had to the Hyper Foundation in the past year is dot dot dot. Uh, let them fill it in, right? Um, so I hope yeah, but see, exactly this is I mean, for. we don't want to have people go through a whole archaeological uh, task either. They only need one thing that qualifies, right? Okay. Do we want to include a checklist? I mean, the, what, the, what are we? <laughs> That's why I, I'm trying I really, to, I, I don't want to mislead people into saying they, they need to go back for the whole year and look at all the things they've done and compile all of this. This is not what we're asking for either. 
So we need to be careful the way we phrase the question. They just need to provide some evidence that they qualify. And it could just be, you know, here is my GitHub ID, and you can go look at the all the PRs and see and you know that I've done something along those lines. And if I mean, I suspect that there are many cases where we already know the answer, and it's just there may be cases where Rice says, "I've never heard of that person. Who are they? What are they doing?" And they may look a bit beyond that. But so. Um, so for the, the script emits the stuff and this, this is for the maintainers, not the, the people who do things, but I, you know, on a per repo basis, I can look in here and see like, what did somebody do? So the, the check website is going to look at, at this, this list of people that have done something, uh, I haven't written the script yet to automatically update this to um so when when i did this by hand um the uh the number of people that had done a qualifying activity this year to to run were around 1900 um so i think that's going to get almost everybody uh so what I will do like soon is get that list into the voter website uh, so people can check. I, I said voter, the the TOC uh, uh, check my status website. And that'll be something that gets updated once a day by get of actions or whatever. Uh, then it would be the further edge case would be you know, if they don't have a GitHub ID, they haven't done anything, that's where it's going to be. We'll have to go look in the wiki or, or something of that nature. Um, okay. Uh, so the other thing here, uh, I'm making one last change. uh to this page but uh if you wouldn't mind refreshing again sean sorry about that um so i included kind of the please check all that apply um of what it is that you've done uh that would qualify you to run for the the toc election um it's i don't know if it's a complete list but i did include the other and then please provide details so um, maybe this will address the concerns or no of not having to say here's a hundred thousand commits that I've done over the yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments then on the nomination process or the timeline here? Okay, uh, so then for the election process, uh, the voting period for the six uh, TS, TOC members are uh, from November 1st through November 30th. Um, so uh, we will obviously announce the slate of candidates. Uh, we're going to use a new, new tool this year uh, called Helios Voting. Uh, it's a tool that has been used by other Linux Foundation projects uh, it uses your GitHub ID in order to allow for voting. And since all of the voters must be active maintainers, um, that shouldn't be a problem for people. Um, and then uh, the email will be sent out to those eligible voters on how they will cast their ballots. The ballots will be cast. Um, the election will close at 11.59 p.m. U.S. Pacific time on November 30th. I believe this tool sends out um, reminders, so there's no sort of reminder email that has to be manually done. Um, it's automated through the tool. And then that vote will determine that the six elected TOC members uh, whose, whose names will be removed from the appointment vote. 
questions on kind of the election timeline and process. So Tracy, I don't have a question. I have a comment or uh -huh. observation I wanted to share with everybody. Uh, this is the first time we have this kind of setup where there's a number of seats that actually get selected and the others are appointed by the board. I, you know, I just want to say, obviously I cannot speak on behalf of the board and I cannot predict how they will actually do it, but I can share from my experience in another LF foundation where there is a similar setup, the way they do it, unless there is a need to do any different, they will basically continue down the list of the election results. And as long as they're happy with what the mix that this gives them, they will just do that. They are not going to bother going for other people, running another election or any of this. They will pick the people from you know, who have been run, running in the election anyway, because that's kind of like by default, if that gives us the right mix they are hoping for, that makes it very easy for them to do. So. Okay, that's extremely interesting. Um, so I guess one of the things that I was uh, thinking about here, Arno, is that I don't know that we should be distinguishing and letting people know whether they got voted in or appointed, if you will. Um, so I wasn't expecting to share the results, uh, except internally within the hyperledger staff, uh, the actual results of the vote. But if I hear what you're suggesting, you're suggesting that the, those vote results would also be shared with the governing board members so that they could um determine whether or not they want to to choose the next five or choose some other yeah ones. so that's interesting i mean uh, that's the way it was done in open ssf last year i you know again i mean every foundation can decide to run it whichever way they want but mm -hmm. uh they they in the case of open ssf they announced the people who had been elected and then they say okay there is i forget if it's three more seats or four more seats will be uh, appointed by the board and the board say okay these are the people but i actually i don't know if made it public to be honest but i know for a fact that you know they just took the next people on the list yeah and they were happy with the mix that it gives them so they were like okay that satisfies us anybody they had a vote quickly within the board to say yeah happy with that good and they announced the next if you know people had been appointed by the board as being also members of the TAC, and that's it. So I, again, I mean, you know, they may it, it may go differently here, but based on my experience, the LF staff will tend to say, "Hey, this is how we do it elsewhere. <laughs> you might want to consider doing it that way too." And again, I mean, they will exercise their right to override the results if they feel like this is not giving them the right mix, which is the whole point of having this, uh, this feature, right? They mm -hmm. may say, no, it just gives in this too many people from the same project, the same company, we're better off going down further into the list of, but most likely they won't, you know, they, they, they will stop from there at least, right? Because they know these are people who have nominated themselves and are willing to do the job to start with, which is easier than going to fish for other people and say, hey, you didn't run for the election, but really we'd like you to be on this, on this talk so that there is diversity. Uh, it's not, yeah. again, I mean, they, they may very well do it, but you know, it seems pretty clear to me that they will try to find the easy way first to fill those seats. Yeah, we, we specifically, I made sure that the, based on our conversations previously, that the charter specifically says that the governing board has to choose from the nominees, um, that they cannot go outside of the, the list of yeah. nominees uh, because of the whole, like, okay, you didn't sign up 
uh, maybe you didn't want to do the job and now you're being forced to do a job that you didn't really want to do, right? Um, but I, I do think it's an interesting sort of uh, perspective, Arno, and I think um, we have a governing board meeting on Monday, and I think I'll bring that up. I don't think uh, Daniela is on this call, but I'll um, try to talk to Daniela before the call just to let her know that I'll bring up kind of this election process um, so that there can be some discussion about what the governing board wants to do, whether or not they want the the results from the vote or whether they want to start with the list of nominees minus the, the uh, six elected TOC members. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Other other comments or questions on the election process itself? Okay. So then uh, with the appointment process, this may change based on that conversation with the governing board, but uh, the intent was to take the TOC nominees, exclude the six elected TOC members and have the governing board vote um, for a period of about a week, um, which was what was suggested by Min. Uh, we had, I had this much longer, but she suggested just a, a short period for the governing board. Um, so, We'll, I guess uh, the intent was to use OPA vote, um, which is what we've used in the past for the TSC elections. It's what the governing board uses for any sort of elections that they have. Um, the process really is to send out an email and a reminder email and to have the election close on the 9th. Um, the 9th is a Friday, so I did um, say that on the 12th, an email would be sent to the TSC. TOC mailing list announcing the newly elected and appointed members. Um, and then that group of people would elect the, uh, the new TOC chair and vice chair. Now I gave a, a long period for that. I don't know that it's gonna take um, that long, uh, but this is obviously the holiday period. And so there are vacations and things that I expect people to be on. And so I wanted to make sure that we gave time on the front end and the back end of those holidays to um, ensure that everybody had a chance to express their desire for the TOC chair and vice chair. And that as far as the, the election goes, it'll be very similar to what we've done in the past where uh, there's an election for the chair and then the person who gets the second highest votes would get the vice chair. Questions on the appointment process or that chair, vice chair election? Quiet group today. <laughs> Either that means things are good or uh, things are so bad that, that you don't want to comment. Um, we love it. We love it. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> if I may, a little question. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so I had some small contribution uh, to Iroha, and I was actively supporting uh, with all the questions people had. Um, so even with that, am I allowed to participate? You are definitely allowed to nominate yourself, um, given Thank the you contributions much. that you've had. Uh, as far as uh, the voting process, I guess the question is, Victor, are you listed as a maintainer in the maintainer's files in the Aroha? Yes. Okay. Uh, so if you are listed as a maintainer, then you would be allowed to vote, assuming that you had active um, contributions, uh, which it sounds like you have. Sounds good. Other questions or comments on the election process? And they don't have to be on this page. They could be very similar to what Victor just had. Um, I have one. Um, <laughs> who is eligible to vote? And uh, basically, yep. um, what happens if people decide not to vote? Um, is there a, a quorum that needs to be reached? Okay. Uh, so, Sean, if you wouldn't mind going back up to the top where we have the charter. Uh, so, 4.a.2, um, 
Elections will be administered and overseen by the TOC, all maintainers or similar technical role in the case of supported projects, which we don't have any currently supported projects. Um, so uh, all maintainers of any technical project who have been active in the past year will elect six individuals. So if you've been an active maintainer in the last year, then you will be eligible to vote. Uh, you are not required to vote, but you are eligible to vote uh, as we've never had any sort of quorum uh, for people to vote and we still don't have any sort of quorum for people to vote. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Uh, Peter, sorry, I uh, wasn't paying attention to hands. Peter. No problem. Uh, for me, it's just a quick thumbs up. I think this is a good idea and I'm happy that we are working on it and I'll be curious to see how it goes. All right, thanks, Peter. Anything else that anybody would like to add on the TOC election? Okay, uh, so that was the end of the official agenda. Is there anything else uh, that anybody would like to cover? Arun? Yes, so this is related to the security task force. Um, mm -hmm. I know I missed the previous call, but Arnold caught me up um, I, stood, I mean, this week and then he updated discussions that he had with Hart, and then he also brought in some of the interesting conversations from OpenSSL, the tools that have been worked upon uh, within that foundation. Um, and there will be few explorations going on um, in the coming days from by, by the task force, which will come up with um, as proposals here. There is one pending action item that um, that is overdue for now. I know I promised it soon after the uh, the global forum event, but I could not do it. Yet. That is related to um, how do we and the, the the security process itself, right? The reviewing, how can somebody come and report, and what are the actions to be taken by each team? It's again listed under Open SSL. Um, we had one deep conversations on that when uh, I think a few weeks ago. And Hart had suggested that we should uh, probably incorporate the ones that are non controversial. Yeah, that's again something that I'll be putting up um, definitely this week. That's an overdue item. Okay. Just an update on what's happening. And I do request everyone to please participate in the task force. All right, thanks everyone for the update. Anything else that anybody would like to cover? So um, before I let you go, I know you guys all wanted to get out of here, but um, before I do let you go, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was our backlog items. Uh, that we do have uh, still open. One is on the security process, which is being uh, handled via the security task force. But the other one is um, is related to the projects who have not submitted their TSC quarterly project updates um, and moving them to a dormant state after a TSC discussion and possible votes. I do know that there were a number of comments on this um, back when it was originally open. Um, we haven't made any sort of further progress on what we want to do specifically with this um, with this particular issue, whether or not we want to implement this, whether or not we want to close it. And I thought maybe we could have a quick discussion on any thoughts that people might have on this particular backlog item. Uh, I'd really like to see if we could address it before the end of this term. 
one way or the other, be it close it or uh, take action on it. So uh, just as a, a reminder, the idea was to, uh, for those who had not uh, put in their quarterly project updates, um, to have the TSC vice chair reach out to the projects when they miss submitting the, the project updates um, via either uh, reaching out to the last submitter of the project quarterly update, reaching out via the project mailing list and reaching out via the project's official chat channel. Uh, and then if we're unable to reach someone for an entire quarter, we would have a discussion within the technical oversight committee to determine if uh, we should vote on moving the project to a dormant state. Uh, so I, I know this came up when we had some projects who hadn't submitted their, I think it was Borough actually when they hadn't submitted their report for probably about um, a half a year. And so uh, this was something that I created as a potential action that we could take. And I wanna see if we want to uh, you know, implement this or if we think this is not needed. Any thoughts, Arun? Right, I think I kind of remembered this discussion where it, it got diverted to another discussion as well, where um, people started asking, should we even make this decision? Because project teams could be busy on doing some things. And then there was other kind of discussion that went into asking if report is what we expect from each of the project every quarter, then what, what is it that we expect from each of that report? Can we extract it for time being and then ask project teams to update when they when they can? But then um, the other thinking that I also have is we will be reaching out to project maintainers and if they're not submitting quarterly report, or at least they should be responding back to the question that uh, TOC members would ask them. And if they're not even responding to the questions, then it's e it's equivalent to that project is not responding to any concerns with their project, right? So if mm -hmm. they're not responding to uh, the TOC itself, how can they respond? Um, so we can imagine like what kind of response structure would they have for new contributors or somebody who is new to the project? It's, it's a concern. It, there should be at least some response. It cannot be that project has not responded to any of the questions itself. That definitely is a concern. Yes, completely agree. That's a, a big concern. Uh, we want people to be able to get responses from the project uh, if they have issues or they're looking to make contributions. Arno? Yeah, I mean, I. My, my gut reaction is we don't need to add anything because this is this is why we have these quarterly reports and it was to you know keep make sure that you know projects are still going on and uh, you know have a heartbeat so to speak and so it seems to me that this is a natural you know possible outcome of a project not responding not filling out the quarterly reports. And I don't know that we need to add a special rule stating that, but I, I have I was trying in the back to go to the website. I would. Uh, it depends on whether we specify the way we specify how you enter dormant state, basically exclude the talk doing this. Then we would have to change it to say, oh, one of the possibilities is the talk has not heard from the project, such as you know not receiving any quarterly reports, and therefore the talk might decide to move the project to dormant. But I think, in a sense, we've seen this actually happen already without that rule, right? The, the, we, we've seen in the cases of the existing projects we had, like uh, Borough, uh, and where. We knew, you know, every time I had to like, you know, uh, ask them repeatedly, hey, where's your report? Where's your report? And then eventually they themselves admit that, okay, forget it. We can't keep doing this. So, I, yeah, I, my, my, you know, again, I, I think I don't feel like this is necessary in general. I think we shouldn't just keep adding more rules for the sake of it unless it's strictly needed. Okay, 
and or no, it, the project can enter the dormant state when the normal functions are suspended or slowed down for a period of time. The TFC decides to move a project to or from the dormant state upon request. Now it does not say who requests that. Uh, it just says upon request. Um, so I think you know if the TFC is requesting it, then the TFC um, obviously can make that determination as to whether or not it makes sense to go to the dormant state. So um, sounds like we want to close this issue. Any. Anybody want to see this issue remain open and that we take action on it? Okay, um, then we will close this issue since nobody uh, wanted to take action. No, I think we should close, but put a statement saying um, something along the lines that, you know, the current rules already allow us to do this. Okay. Works for so, me. I will do that. Or no. Um, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any other items to discuss today? Okay. Well, we will then close out the meeting and thank you all for attending. Hopefully next week we will be talking about the Anon Creds project. Uh, uh, Stephen is attempting to get that ready for us. Uh, we also do have uh, the Prune Lab that would like to present to us at some point. Um, I'll decide whether or not that's next week, depending on whether Stephen's ready for us uh, next week or not. I don't want to do both of them at the same time. So um, we do have both of those on our backlog of agenda items for um, upcoming meetings. So with that, I will close today's meeting and uh, wish you all a good week. Thank you, Tracy. Bye.